Hello friends, it's me again, and I'm here with part two of a story by our friend Roku. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm actually kind of nervous because I remember part one, but I want to know what the rest of the story is. And so, if you remember part one, that's, that's all the warning I'm going to give you. Just, let's see. This is... Memoirs of a Beard Magnet. The Hills Have Beards, Part 2. The Tragic Leg Beard. My friend Helga and I had grown up together to the age of 12 in a backwoods swamp wilderness, going to a school in a relic of a small building from an age past. She and her mother and the other siblings moved away to another state and what I hoped was a better life. Away from the hell-on-earth shack and the abuse that had been their life for years. Oh, thank God they got out of that house. I was so sad to see her go, but I was happy to think they would at least have something better. Every weekday I would walk to school past their old house, where I knew that their father had gotten his stepdaughter pregnant, and I would hurry by, queasy at the thought that he might be home or watching me through some hole peeled in the yellow paper that covered the windows. All was well enough, all was peaceful enough. And in a few months, I didn't think about him or the darkness of that place any longer. I knew everything could be a little brighter and a little happier in my actual neck of the woods with one crazy-ass family saved, and maybe a few more to go before anyone would call the area socially habitable. I'd heard stories about the, quote, Rustic Lake Red, unquote, and her husband and father-in-law who all lived in the little house behind the swampy lake on the dead-end dirt track where for three months out of the year the lake flooded the road and there was no driving on it or you'd sink up to the axles and no tow truck would come there. There were stories, rumors. I'd heard about the old man, the father-in-law, who would occasionally hide in the bushes down by the train tracks and would jump out and scare little girls on their way home from school until the police intervened and made his son promise to keep him at home. I had heard about how the father and son in years past, during the full moon, walk over the hills to the lake and the woods above my own farm and the national forest land behind our barbed wire fence. Let me tell you, that kept us kids indoors at night. Rustic Lake Red, the wife, was a ginger lady, actually attractive when she combed her hair and wore clean clothes. After her father-in-law died, she had no one to take care of. She would leave the house while her husband was working and walk three miles around the lake to visit my mother, who had nothing but the utmost sympathy and concern for Red. On the weekends when I was home, she would come looking for a cup of coffee and cigarettes and stay for a visit while she rapid smoked with machine gun-like speed, talking a mile a minute. We both knew that she was desperately mentally ill, so we'd let her talk it out, inhale half a pack of my dad's camels in the process. Even though my mother felt kindly and indulgent towards Red, I was under orders to stick around and not leave Mom alone with her, so I ended up listening to how she and her husband had gotten into a fight and broken out the windows in the house, and how he had nailed boards over them with her inside and padlocked the door from the outside before we went to work. Oh my god. She had loosened the boards and escaped to visit us every day. I should mention, I had some nightmares when I was a kid, unsurprisingly. Yeah. My mother repeatedly asked her not to return home while I poured coffee with my white-knuckled hand, but Red vanished five more cigarettes and rattled on how she had to go home and take care of her husband when he got back from work. We were both worried about her safety at home when she left, walking away with her rain boots slapping the dirty road loudly. Later that evening, a county surveyor, a sweet older man who had been plotting property lines in the farms around the lake, dropped by for a visit. With a nervous twitch, he told us what had happened in his quiet Lithuanian accent. I'm already terrified to read the next paragraph. While he and our neighbor were on one of the logging roads, Red approached them, swinging her arms as she marched home. They knew about her and just said hello as she came up to them. The next moment, she threw her sundress up over her face, exposing herself as they backed away in terror. They ran off down the road and back to their cars. He came to feel out what my parents thought he should do, as our older neighbor flatly refused to even deal with the fact that it happened. At this point, my parents sent me to do homework so I couldn't listen in the doorway anymore, and they discussed the situation. 
Within a couple of weeks, some brave souls from social services began to regularly visit Red's home, waterlogged road and all, and got Red on some much-needed medicine. They set rules for the husband and may have gotten him some treatment as well, and they began to manage the case as well as it could be managed in such a remote place. The last time I saw Red, she still smoked and still talked rapidly, but now she made a lot more sense, and my mom helped her make baby clothes for their soon-to-be-born daughter. She and her husband were actually really nice people once they got the support and treatment they needed. No matter how freaky and creepy, there can be hope for the weirdest of neighbors. Two crazy families down, one more to go. Oh my god, okay. So, I'm not gonna lie, like I said when we first started this, I was already tense about where this was gonna go because the first one about the family made me super uncomfortable but the fact that they got out of that house is whew, that that's wonderful that is 100 percent wonderful and this this is actually kind of uplifting it's true with the right treatment the right people the right help anyone can get better and it's amazing to see them go from like two people who were so desperately mentally ill and so angry and twisted and horrible in this remote place to actually good people once they got the help and support they needed. That is a fantastic change. A 100% fantastic change. And that makes me super, super happy. Uh, that's, that's very uplifting. This one is very uplifting. I like hearing that things have gotten better. That is really just wonderful. There's a lot of people in this town that have similar... Like, you can tell. Um, there's a lot of people around here who have, at least it's pretty obvious when you talk to them, uh, there's some kind of mental illness going on. But because, you know, actually getting help and things in this middle of nowhere place is really difficult, a lot of them turn to uh, what we around here have jokingly referred to as our main export. And our main export is methamphetamine. Yeah, there's a lot of drugs. It ain't good. It's uh, it's real bad. It's gotten to the point that the police around here will show up to talk to people specifically because they know that like you could go in and charge people, you could go in and have them arrested, but if you do that, you might as well arrest like nine tenths of the parish because it's not going to change. Really, what people need is actual help and. Law enforcement around here, surprisingly enough, actually has been doing their best to help people. But, you know, they're only one branch, and they need more support from other places. And that's not nearly as easy as one would think. I, a while back, this is kind of a weird, you know, not fully connected, but kind of connected. A while back, I was so incredibly broke, and this was before I started the channel, uh, that I required, um, like, food stamp assistance. There was just no way I could afford food otherwise. And that, the first time I had to do that, which was after Katrina, so everybody had it, that was totally normal, uh, that was wonderful. That saved our lives. So much so, I'm pretty sure I wrote them a letter telling them thank you. But the second time, they specifically were like, you need to be in this kind of job core training. Which, yeah, that makes sense. That's fine. Except that the only office that offered any kind of training like that was three towns over. Now, if you don't have a job and you don't have any money, how are you supposed to get there every other day? That's the kind of logistics problem that this place has. And if that's just, like, nutrition assistance, I can't imagine how the rest of it is. I just can't imagine how the rest of it's broken. And I know there's, like, a lot of people who, you know, the usual go-to whenever I explain this story is like, well, you know, public transport. Like, there is no public transport. There isn't. In this town specifically, if you don't drive, you walk. And that's it. We don't really have anything else. And there is no way to get from one town to another unless you know someone who can bring you and can drive you. But that's not really a thing for a lot of people. You know, that's not really an option. So, it's pretty rough. The, the system definitely needs an overhaul. But I am really glad to hear 
Red and her husband actually got the assistance and the help they needed. Because that is... Reading through part of this, before we even got to that part, that's all I could think is, like, this is hardcore mental illness. Uh, but now knowing that, like, they're getting the help they need, they're actually doing better, uh, they're actually doing a lot better, that's, that's fucking fantastic, you know? That's wonderful. So, that... That was very uplifting, uh, Roku. Thank you for sharing that with us. That that made things feel, made me feel pretty good. I'm actually pretty happy with this story, and I hope you guys are too. And uh, if you are, make sure to do the whole like, comment, subscribe thing, because that's the end of the video. Haha. -ha. Perfect segue. I know. Professionalism. Also, I have a merch store, and I have a Ko-Fi, which are full of just the weirdest things I can think of. You should check those out. And I have a subreddit where you can send your own story. It doesn't necessarily have to be a neckbeard story, as I pointed out in the past. It's just anything interesting that you feel like you want to share, I'll do it for you. So you can check that out. The links to all that and more are in the description below this video and every video. So thank you all for being here. I love you all so very much. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.